one says, and when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all, say all, with one accord in one place. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind, and it filled all the house where they were sitting. And there appeared unto them cloven tongues like as of fire, and sat upon each of them. And they were all, say all, filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. You may have your seat in the presence of our life-changing King and what's his name? Nobody like him in all the earth. And the second scripture I'm going to read to you is in Galatians 5 and 1. And it says, stand fast, therefore, in the liberty wherewith Christ hath made us free. And be not entangled again with the yoke of bondage. So on this Pentecost Sunday, if I will leave with you a thought today, it would be stay free by the power of the Holy Ghost. Stay free by the power of the Holy Ghost. Now we know today is Pentecost Sunday and we know that Pentecost is the second main theme in the book of Acts. In Acts 1 and 4 it mentions it, verses of uh, first chapter verse 4 and 5 and then in Acts 1 and 8. And then we come to the promise being fulfilled here in Acts 2, 1 through 4. Now we know what Pentecost is. Pentecost is the holiday celebrated on the seventh Sunday after Easter which is also 50 days, hence the name, because the name comes from the Greek word Pentecoste, which means 50th. <laughs> 50th. Somebody say 50th. The Holy Spirit came 50 days after the crucifixion. 50 days after the crucifixion, and we know that the number 50 signifies jubilee. It signifies liberty. It signifies freedom. It, it, it tells um, a nation that the economy and the cultural and the environment and communal reset. It's a reset coming. There's a, there's a transformation and there's a, a change. So when Jubilee comes, there's a celebration because the people recognize the freedom that they've gotten. That they've come into the reset that they've been allowed to have. They've been set free from slavery. They've been set free from bondage. They've been set free from all the things that will encumber them and hold them back and reset out to their community. So it's not strange that the day of Pentecost came 50 days after the resurrection of Jesus Christ because we know that Christ came to give us life and then he sealed it the 50th day on the day of Pentecost to say that you're liberated and free. So freedom, what did freedom do? Freedom reversed the verdict and changed the cross from the seal of death to the sign of salvation. It reversed it and sealed it to the entrance of life. Freedom and life in Christ. He says, I don't want you to be mistaken about what happened on Calvary's cross for you. I don't want you to be an irreverent people, so I'm going to seal this thing on Pentecost Sunday. And so every year, when your calendar year, your religious calendar, I want you to be reminded of the hope. I want you to be reminded of the gift that I've given you of freedom. Freedom. Life. We gain access through life in Christ. And that life brought us our freedom. It was the birthday of a new community. Y'all celebrated my birthday. Y'all helped me celebrate and I had a good time. But can I tell you, Pentecost is another day of celebration of the life that Christ came to give us. It's another day to reflect and look on the liberty that Christ sealed for us when the wind came. So it's the birthday of a new community. It's the birth of the church. That's what Pentecost represents. There was no church prior to the day of Pentecost. Pentecost is when the disciples became conscious of this power, of the Spirit's power. 
They became aware. They saw it before their eyes. Yeah, they walked with Jesus and he was teaching them some things and trying to show him some things. But then he says, but the power, he says, I want you to go there because I want you to wait for the power for you to live this thing because I'm going away to be with my father. And if you're going to do greater works than you did walking with me along the earth, you're going to need something to sustain you. You're going to need something to hold you and keep you aware of the liberty that you have so that you won't be in bondage to sin or anybody anymore that's what Pentecost is so he showed it to them right before their eyes in the book of Acts they were on one accord in one place they gathered prepared they were expecting something they were, were believing God for something it was just shared to them so they believed God how can we be a Christian a people of God that believe in the crucifixion but not the power working gift of the Holy Ghost so it's the birth of the church, not when the spirit was first given, but it marked the beginning of their active missionary work. It says things are going to come up on you that will try to keep you distracted or keep you from doing what I called you to do or even challenge your faith, but I'm leaving and giving you power. Power. So he came from time to time in the Old Testament to men of God, empowering them for service, special service, and seemingly withdrew his presence from them when the service was accomplished. But now, he said when Pentecost come, it begins a new ministry. It begins a new operation for the Godhead to infiltrate the earth through the spirit of the living God being empowered in the people of God and us allowing the spirit of God and power of God to flow out of us. To flow out of us so we have to be made aware of Pentecost and the Spirit of God so on the day of Pentecost the Holy Ghost came not only to form the church but to abide with her forever not just form it but to abide within the church forever so if that was what God wanted and that's what he wanted to accomplish why is Holy Spirit ministry the most ignored and misunderstood person in the church ignored number one misunderstood number two in the church that he came forth to birth and bring forth in the church he came forth to show and establish the kingdom of God through how can we misunderstand him how can we ignore his ministry? But he said he came to set us free and make us free indeed. And if you're going to stay free of bondage, if you're going to stay free from sin, then you need the power of the Holy Ghost. But you won't recognize the power of the Holy Ghost if you ignore him, think little or light of his ministry. Can I tell you he's more than tongues? Can I tell you he's more than you cutting your steps and giving you a quench? Or a, qua a quickening, what do they call it? A quickening? He's more than that. He's more than you tearing up the road when, when you feel like the fire of God is on you. He's more than that. He's empowered us. He's come to live within us, to reside in us, to make us a live according to the will, the purpose, and the plan of God. He's more than that. And see, a lot of us come from churches that we've seen some stuff. So-called people catching the Holy Ghost. But then after they walk down on Sunday morning, they lived any kind of way. They talked any kind of way. But can I tell you, the power of the Holy Ghost resides on the inside of us to transform our thinking, to transform the way that we see things outside of us, to transform us into a new man, a new woman that we're no longer the same. The power of the Holy Ghost is enough power to keep us out of bondage. Keep us out of bondage. But see, Elder Torre, we don't employ him. We don't recognize the significance of his ministry. But when we remember Pentecost, we remember God's plan from the beginning to restore men back unto him and to keep us with him. That's how we're going to be kept by the power of the Holy Ghost. 
That's how we stay in the spirit walking according to the plan of God by the power of the Holy Ghost. Yes, we fall short, but because of the power of the Holy Ghost and the Holy Ghost ministry that resides on this inside of me, I can't stay falling short. But if he's not a resident and he's just visiting from time to time, he don't have no room to stay in. He don't have a place to reside. You know how some of us, we, we have our house, we have a guest room for our guest. And sometimes we try to make it uncomfortable because we ain't trying to have our guest stay too long. <laughs> so we may not clean up as much. We may not, you know, make it all comfortable and cool because we're trying to make it uncomfortable for you so that you won't reside. So can I tell you the flesh tries to make it uncomfortable for the Holy Ghost to reside. <laughs> Makes it uncomfortable for you for him to sit and to reside and to dwell in your mind, in your attitude, in your behavior. It's uncomfortable because he says, I need, this, I need this clean. I need this sanctified and set apart for my use. So it's not going to be comfortable for you. It's going to cost you a sacrifice. You're going to have to give up something if I'm going to reside here. You got to make space for me. There has to be room for me, for me to reside here. So he wants us to know him as he really is. He does not belong to a certain age group, a denomination, or a movement. He belongs in our lives. He is for our lives. Holy Spirit's ministry is for our lives. And we see that throughout the book of Acts in the early church. We see it. We see the church looked to, interacted with, depended on, and spoke of the Holy Spirit. They talked about it. That's why even when you talk about the church, and even, though, even when you reference the church, church and you want an example of the church, you go to the book of Acts. You look at what the apostles, the apostles' doctrine and how they walked and how they talked, and you see what God's plan was for the church, how he planned for the church to be in the earth, and how he planned us to operate and to flow as Christians and as a Christian community. We see the example. So he's telling us, even in this text, he says, remember Remember Pentecost. He says, when you remember Pentecost, it will revive the hope that's within you. When you remember Pentecost, you will remember this life that I died to give you and how you're supposed to live it. When you remember Pentecost. So let's look at Ephesians. We're talking about staying free, right? We got a whole lot of word this month. And even during the women's conference, how God poured out on us. And I believe breakthrough and deliverance came because everything that we were praying for, fasting for, leading up to that conference was revealed. It was either spoken out of the preacher or spoken out of the, the psalmist, but it was coming forth. So I believe God did some great and mighty things during that conference. But can I tell you, and in order for you to stay free and to stay in that place with him, you need the power of the Holy Ghost. So Ephesians. One, verse 13 and 14. In whom ye also trusted. After that ye heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also after that ye believe. So then after you've trusted in the word of God, you've received the gospel of your salvation, you got saved, and you believe in him, you were sealed. You were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise, which is the earnest of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession unto the praise of his glory. He says, I sealed you when you start trusting and believing in me and receive me with the Holy Spirit's promise, letting you know that I am coming back. This is a part down payment on what I want you to continue on in. So it's, it's, it's a part 
partnership as well because he's partnering you with you and you're partnering with him and you're saying, God, I still trust you and I believe you. I'm waiting for you to return. And, the, and your seal of promise, your Holy Ghost lets me know that you're coming back for your own. Your Holy Ghost lets me know that you won't allow your community to be in bondage. Your Holy Spirit dw dwelling on the inside of me lets me know that I am victorious in you. The Holy Spirit. So he sent his spirit. God sent his spirit in the earth and through us so that Jesus would be revealed. So that the Son of God and the entire body of Christ will be empowered. So that's why we're called into sonship. That's why we're called into a greater revelation of who Jesus is. Because he's saying it's through my spirit that these things are revealed. So that's why the Holy Spirit's ministry is so important. Because none of yourselves can you understand this. Not of yourself can you ascertain all that I have for you and all that I desire to do through you, but it's Holy Spirit's ministry. Let's go stay in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 18. For through him, we both have access by one spirit unto the Father. Now therefore... Ye are no more strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and the what? Household of God. And are built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief corner stone. In him, in whom all the building fitly joined frame together, groweth unto an holy temple in the Lord, in whom ye also are builded together. For and what? Habitation of God through what? The habitation of God through the Spirit of God. So it's through him. That's why Pentecost is so important because he's saying through him you can't do enough good works. You can't offer up enough good services. But it's in me. Your, our, our, our righteousness is that filthy rag, so I had to come that you can have this life and this freedom, but Holy Spirit is the way that you are going to maintain. Maintain. Let's go to John 14. We have to remember Holy Spirit's ministry. We have to employ him. We have to be aware of what is going on in the spirit realm. John 14, 16 in the Amplified. Do we have that version? Let me read it because my phone is not coming up. Let's put it up. 14, 16. And it says, and I will ask the Father... And he will give you another comforter, counselor, helper, intercessor, advocate, strengthener, and standby. And he may remain with you. How long? What's the next verse? The spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, welcome take to its heart, because it does not see him or know and recognize him but you know and recognize him why for he lives with you constantly and will be in you jump to verse 27 because we ain't got time to read that whole text because y'all know I would verse 27 peace I live with you my own peace I now give and bequeath to you come on somebody that's that inheritance. That's that will talking stuff. Bequeath to you. Not as the world gives do I give to you. Do not let your hearts be troubled. Neither let them be afraid. Stop allowing yourselves to be agitated and disturbed. And do not permit yourselves to be fearful and intimidated and cowardly and unsettled. That's the power of the Holy Ghost. When you get that and you recognize that, you'll stay free. He said, I gave it to you. He said, my peace, I leave it with you. I bequeath it to you. Woo, thank you, Lord. Just because I adopted you. 
Because you're my own, I give it to you. Woo! This is a reminder of what we have in Holy Spirit. This is what we have in Holy Spirit. So Jesus is telling the disciples, even he's telling us today, look, Holy Spirit wants to come. He wants to take up residence within you for a purpose. He wants to dwell on the inside of you until everything within you bring him glory. Because we within ourselves cannot bring God glory outside of being transformed and changed by Holy Spirit's ministry, being washed with the washing of the word, that's how we're able to bring God glory. So he says, don't get it twisted. Don't get wrapped up in yourself. Know that it is the power of the Holy Ghost. Galatians 3 and 13. Jesus. Tell your neighbor we need the power of the Holy Ghost. Woo, thank you, Jesus. Woo, we believe, we believe, we believe because of what he did. And this is what we're getting ready, getting ready to read. Galatians 3 and 13, it says, Christ hath redeemed us from the curse of the law, being made a curse for us. For it is written, Curse is everyone that hangeth on a tree, that the blessing of Abraham might come on the Gentiles through who? That we might receive the promise of the, through faith. The promise of the Spirit through faith. Do you believe in the Holy Ghost? Do you believe in his ministry? Do you believe in the redemptive work of Christ on the cross? How can we be believe in the redemptive work of Christ on the cross and not believe in Holy Spirit's ministry? He's saying that you, you ought to be believing. So Galatians 4 and 3, let's look at that. Because we, we have to recognize that we're free and we got to not misuse our freedom. You know how we like to say, we come into the kingdom and we free. We got liberty. We ain't got to go to church all the time. We ain't got to do this. We ain't got to do that. We take our liberty to a whole nother level. But the Spirit of the Lord is letting us know, don't misuse your liberty. Don't misuse this liberty. We, we in America, land of the free, home of the brave. But when you get to breaking laws, when you get to not being governed by Caesar and what the laws of the land tells you to do, you've misused your freedom. Lord, have mercy, have mercy on me. So let's look at this here. Galatians 4, 3 through 9. And it says, even so we... When we were children, were in bondage under the elements of the world. But when the fullness of the time was come, God sent forth his son, made of a woman, made under the law. Why did he send his son? To re and then he said the fullness of time. Y'all saw on the day of Pentecost had fully come. Fullness of time, fully come. Then the, to redeem them that were under the law that we might what receive the adoption of sons and because ye are sons God hath sent forth the spirit of his son into your hearts crying what Abba father wherefore thou art no more a servant but a son and if a son then an heir of God through Christ you're a son, you're an heir of God through Christ, then you ought to live like it. Your liberty ought to reflect it. Don't misuse your liberty. Now verse 8, how be it then when ye knew not God, ye did service unto them which by nature are no gods. But now after that ye have known God, or rather are known of God, how turn ye again to the weak and beggarly elements whereunto ye desire again? Do y'all know what that says? It says what it says. How we've been liberated and adopted as sons of God. Come into this new liberty and this new freedom in Christ. And now we want to go back to the old elements and the bondage in which we were freed from. You've been made free from the law. He says, now make your decisions and, and allow me to guide you by my spirit. 
You've been free from that. How you going to now still be governed by the elements of bondage? How you still going to listen to that thing that killed you? That's just like, I'm always, the courtroom of law always come up in my messages. But that's just like jail. When they, they say offenders go to jail or whatever, they're more apt to go back to jail because they go back to their old societies and old communities that they've been a part of. When they've not been rehabilitated to be reestablished in a new community, then they go back to what they've always known. Think about it. You say, why well, ain't in jail? I ain't never been to jail. But when you're in bondage to sin, when that thing keep having a yoke around your neck, you just can't seem to shake it loose. It just keep drawing you back and wheeling you in because you've not cut ties with that community. Your societal influences is still the same. So you get out of jail and you go back to the same hood the same set of folk, the same things. So now your perspective can't even change because now what you see is what you've always seen. So now you begin to operate in flow like you've always operated in flow. But he says, because of the power and the spirit of God that I've sent forth to make you free, I need you to stay free indeed. Don't misuse your freedom. Did y'all see that in that text? The elements of it all. I was reading all about the, the percentage of people that go in jail and they say, how can we help them stay free? We empower them. We empower them that they can do better. We empower them. We show them something different. We empower them with resources. We empower them to transform their thinking and say, you got to think this way now. We empower them to believe that they can make a living outside of criminal activity. We empower them. And the Spirit of the Lord says, we empower you in the church to let you know that you can live outside of sin. You can live over and above sin. You don't have to keep falling in fornication. You don't have to keep falling in adultery. You make a decision, a decision, a decision. It's something, it, that thing have a hold on you so I believe Elder Samal when they, when they come out of jail that they have to be very intentional about staying out. They got to work overtime to stay out. Whereas they was slinging dope if they ended up in jail for that, they can't just work no one job. They got to get multiple jobs. They got to get multiple streams of income flowing. They got to be very intentional about it. Even to the point of where, child, I know we used to hang, but we can't hang no more. Because, see, I got to stay out. So some of y'all need to tell some of those influences, I'm not going to be wrapped up and tied up into that thing anymore. I got to stay out. So I'm going to be intentional about this. I'm going to work overtime. Look, intentional is discipline. Intentional is sacrifice. But it depends on how free you want to be. How bad do you want to stay free? Do somebody else want it worse than you, better than you? How bad I want it ain't got nothing to do with you getting it for yourself. Stay free. So now, under the spirit of the living God. Let's go to um, 2 Corinthians. Boy, no, no, we don't have to turn that. Let me read it to you. 2 Corinthians 3 and 17. It says, Now the Lord is that spirit. And where the spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. So as a new community, as a Christian believer, we got to stay where he is. We have to stay where he is. Now the Lord is that spirit, and where the spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. So I got to stay where he is. 
So the folk that tell you it don't take all that and you don't have to go to church, I got to stay where he is because it is the house of God. It is the place where we gather together in his name and other corporate believers, a community of faith that we get charged and empowered and live free. I got to tell your neighbor, I got to stay where he is. Because the more Christ-like you are, and this is the thing, the more Christ-like you are, the freer you become. Because you ain't got to try to live two lives. You ain't got to try to pretend with the turf folk and then blend in with the world. Keep my friends in the church and then try to keep my friends in the world. Go to church on Sunday, but I don't want my friend to feel bad, so I'm going to the club on Friday. Where he is, where he is, we got to stay where he is. <laughs> because the more God-centered, the less self-centered. The more God-centered, the less self-centered. I was um, doing something in the bathroom um, last week, and I heard this, and I was like, Lord, I hear that. I heard, the less you do, the less you do is the less you do. So I was like, Lord, what are you saying? What are you saying to me? The less spiritual activity and regimen and, and, and how we, we are so, um, we do the least of these things spiritually. The least of them. We, the, the bare minimum. The less we pray. The less we read our word. The less we meditate on the goodness and the faithfulness of God. The less we meditate on the word of God. The less we give attention to heavenly things and spiritual things is the less we do. The less we do is the less we do. Now it's like God help us as your people to be balanced in what we do. Because, see, we take this freedom and we, and we got to not look at Christianity as bondage. You don't, don't know what Jesus you serving and don't know what kind of Christ you have on the inside of you because Christ has made me free. Free. So I'm free in him. Second Corinthians, and it's in him because I told you I won't have nothing in ourselves and we can't do nothing within ourselves. Second Corinthians 3, that same chapter, verse 5 and 6, it says, not that, not that we were are sufficient of ourselves to think anything as of ourselves, but our sufficiency is of God, who also hath made us able ministers of the New Testament, not of the letter, but of the Spirit, for the letter killeth, but the Spirit give life. We got to stay free. This liberty that we have, we got to stay free. We're constrained by his love. The love of God constrains us. Our love for him keeps us in bound. And see, that's why he tells us, even in Acts in that same chapter, when um, they got done preaching and receiving the Holy Ghost, they told him, they, he said, repent and be baptized. Because you're going to need this. I know you've had this experience, but long term. To keep you. When you come out of this place and you come out of the anointing and you come out of this experience and you go back to your house and you go back on that job, this you need to be kept. And you need to know what it means to be kept. You need to know what to do to get back into the place where you need to be with me. So repent and be baptized. Stay free. 2 Corinthians 13 in the message. Do we have that in the message? Oh, Jesus. Holy Ghost power. Sustaining power. Mm. Keeping power. The old folks used to tell us that. And you'd be like, well, I don't want to be. What they mean by that? I don't know what they mean. Child. 
when you've walked with the Lord any amount of time them old songs and those old sayings what the old saints used to say have some great meaning to you so when they tell you baby he'll keep you uh, if you want to be kept they not lying because when I wanted to fall short when I wanted to turn back when I wanted to run the other way Holy Ghost said no you're called to too much purpose no you got greater work to do no this assignment is on your life Shout. he has greater for you so how do we allow these small gods these little gods to ensnare us these small gods to wrap us up where we have no reverence Woo, Jesus we have no love for God like we're supposed to have that we allow our attitude and our behavior to keep us in bondage okay 2nd Corinthians we got to stay free y'all he did too much do we know the power of the cross the power of the cross then he sailed it with the Holy Ghost okay 2nd Corinthians 13 and 14 in the message it says (laughs) the amazing grace of the master Jesus Christ the extravagant love of God the intimate friendship of the Holy Spirit be with all of you this is how we're going to stay free by the amazing grace of the master (laughs) Jesus Christ the extravagant love of God the intimate fellowship of the Holy Spirit that's how we're going to stay that's how we're going to be kept we have to remember that we receive his grace he lavished us with his love that we receive but we got to have an intimate friendship (laughs) with the Holy Ghost you know there's something about an intimate friendship just think about your friends now if you're a bad friend don't think about it but you think about your friendships that you talk, you have conversations, you know, you run things by each other. You know, when you tripping, they let you know you tripping. If they're a good friend. <laughs> when you want to be in that low place, they listen to you for a little while, then they tell you what the word says and they remind you of what you're supposed to be doing. This is the intimate friendship that Holy Ghost wants to have with us. He wants us to listen to him and not silence his voice. He wants us to take his cues and his instruction and his guidance and not shove him to the side. He wants you to stop taking him off mute. And hear and heed his instruction. You know, with a friend, if you keep calling on a friend and, and, and they're there and they give you the counsel, but after a while when you stop calling and you stop heeding counsel, the friend then gets the message. I don't think she is as good of a friend to me than I am to her. I don't think this friendship is necessary is worth it so then you don't hear from the friend no more then we get used to that and then when time passes and the more time that passed and you ain't had no conversation or even dealt with an offense of something you get further and further away from a reconciliation Even in moments when you think about it, you say, it's been too long now. They ain't even going to remember now. It's not of that important no more. There's not an urgency anymore. It's a, it's a, it's a desensitizing. The further and the further, the more and the more I dismiss. I dismiss. I ain't got to hear that. I don't want to hear that. I ain't trying to do that either. 
And he's saying, I'm trying to help you. I'm the Sanate Lamboni. I've been called to walk alongside you and to dwell on the inside of you. I've been called to instruct you in righteousness and allow you to walk in the spirit of truth. I've been assigned to your life for that. Oh, Jesus, help me in here, Holy Ghost. So last scripture, and I'm going to my seat. Romans. We got to stay free, y'all. Whatever you got to do. Man, it's something. And I, and I was thinking, even back to the jail thing, I was thinking, I was like, man, if I do jail, folks be like, you don't want to go to jail, but fo- there are repeat offenders. Like, folks, go, I'm like, dang, if I go to jail one good time, I don't think I want to go back. <laughs> but if you don't set up the, yourself for success, you go end up back in jail. Can I tell you? You ha- may have been delivered set free made whole and complete but if you don't set yourself up for success you are gonna be bound again with seven times a stronghold and it's gonna be harder and harder for you to shake that thing loose or cut that thing off of your life I'm telling you seven times stronger stop playing with the devil stop playing with demonic activity and principality you have no power you have no strength you have no might yourself can't stand up to that Romans 6 and 22 in the King James Version but now being made free from sin and become servants to God ye have your fruit unto holiness and the end everlasting light life our fruit should be unto holiness what are we producing out of our lives are we producing fruits of righteousness fruits of holiness are we producing fruit of the flesh self soul God says if you're gonna stay free you gotta live holy it ain't no way around that we want modern day millennial type cultural type meet me where I am let's have church in the club type of fruit of holiness he says be ye holy for I am holy if we want to be where he is if he's a holy God he's not dwelling in unholy places be holy holiness is not out of style and it ain't in a style (laughs) but it is a life style It's the fruit unto holiness. We've been around all of these things. All of these people and that's just messing with our virtue. Messing with stuff that's messing with our virtue. He says, be holy, for I am holy. So if you're going to stay free, this is what's required. Be where I am. Be holy. Live holy. And be intentional about staying free. You know, I was thinking about, um, you know, white and the significance of the Holy Spirit is white. So I was like, well, I wear white today. <laughs> and as I was wearing, putting on um, this dress, I heard the Spirit of the Lord says, the significance of white is like my people waving a white flag. And that white flag is for surrender. And he says, if my people will surrender unto me, and allow me to be all that I've come to be in their life. 
they will experience freedom like they've never experienced before. You know, you wave the white flag usually when you're surrendering because you, you know you can't win against the, your opponent, right? Your enemy is overthrowing you. He whooping you. He beating you. And before you have any more casualties, before you lose any other thing, like the end, your life, you wave that white flag. God wants us to surrender to him. All of it. Surrender to him. All of yourself, all of your being, it's going gonna, it's gonna to be challenging. It's, it's a sacrifice. It's, it's, it, it may be lonely at times, but there is a surrender that is going to elevate you to this greater place of freedom. It's based on that surrender though. We don't want to be in the same place. We always talking about victory. We always talking about a spiritual reset and refreshing and God bless me, give me this and open up though. But there's a greater level of surrender. He says, I've given up all. What you willing to give up? What are you sacrificing? What is your sacrifice? He says, holy and acceptable unto me. That says, I got to be holy. Everybody's standing. And in this moment, even on this Pentecost Sunday, just reflect inwardly, inward reflection. And, and, and think about and consider what is it that I've not surrendered to God that keeps me in bondage is it worth it what is it that keeps me in these cycles of, of, of defeat in my mind and in bondage in my heart and in my soul is it worth it what is it that keeps me from not elevating to another place in God or growing even in my relationship with him are you willing to surrender it is it worth it God wants all of us even the parts that we that's not so lovely <laughs> that's what Holy Spirit is for to wash us to cleanse us from all unrighteousness Purge us with his stuff. Wash us that way we may be clean. And make us whiter than snow. But see, we got to be with him in order for that to happen. Not allowing anything to separate us or get in the way of getting next to him. Not anybody. No thing, nothing. But God, we want you. So, Father, in this moment, we humble ourselves in your presence and we thank you.